mentioned in particular for Berkeley County for the levy. Uh, Pat Murphy, the president of the Board of Education, and Jack uh, Jackie Long, the vice president, will be here with us in the 10 o'clock hour from 8 until 10. We will take our turn each half hour with each of the four major candidates for governor in this Republican primary coming up. But uh, before then, we thought it might be interesting to go around the state and uh, take a look at some of these races from an analytical point of view. And that's why we've asked Mark Blankenship from MBE Research, the owner of that company, to join us via telephone. He's done polling in the state for more than 20 years. Mark, good morning. Thank you so much for joining us today. Hey, Rob. Uh, Thanks for having me. I appreciate being here. Absolutely. If you don't mind, could you tell us uh, what you do specifically, Mark, your methodology and your history of doing this? Yeah, sure. We, um, you know, I've I've been sort of in politics uh, since 1996 in West Virginia. Uh, When I was a much younger man, uh, I got uh, came out of WVU and went to work for Cecil Underwood's campaign for governor. Ah, for Governor Underwood. Uh, and I became uh, sort of involved in his polling uh, and the, that sort of macro political process. Uh, and then in 2000, he lost. I went to work for a polling firm uh, for three, four or five years uh, and then started my own firm. And we've been doing it uh, ever since. And we do a lot of issues based polling and a lot of political uh, candidate polling uh, in the state and have since. Uh, you know, like I said, for about 25 years now. Uh, and, um, you know, we do primarily live calling, uh, you know, live. Everybody gets the telephone polls um, where a live caller asks you the question uh, on the poll. Uh, and that's different today than it, you know, 20 years ago, that's really the only methodology that you use today. There's a lot of different types of polling, uh, but none as reliable as that kind of uh, fundamentally sound live telephone caller. Has that changed with the decrease in landlines and the almost universal adoption of cellular phones? Um, it has changed a little. You know, we, we still call cell phones. Right. So we'll call landlines. I think it's it, it, the last I looked and I'd have to look now. There's about 65, maybe a little higher than that. 65 percent of the state uh, is what we call cell only. Uh, and then the balance of that are basically both. Somebody has a cell phone and a landline, uh, but it's about 65 percent have a, a only a cell. And so you'll see these methodologies come up that are what we call like text to web. You'll get a text to your phone, you click on a link and you'll fill out a survey online basically via your phone. Uh, and that, that's an acceptable sort of methodology to augment uh, the live caller portion of your survey. But again, uh, the most reliable uh, and sort of gold standard of the polling industry are the live telephone uh, calls. So you're not like, this is John Gilstrap, good morning. You're not one of those suspected spam calls that are coming through. I would get a text on my phone? You you would get a text on your phone uh, or you would get a call directly and, you you know, if you answered it, it, it is a live person. Uh, and we go through a, a pretty um, long preamble uh, when you answer the phone that just says, look, this is, such and such. I'm calling from MBE Research. We're not selling you anything. We're not asking you to buy anything. Uh, We are only interested in your opinions and it's confidential. Um, And once you explain it to the the recipient of the call, uh, the response rate goes goes way up. What is your response rate, Mark? Um, It's about depending, you know, response rate is a tricky thing but if you factor in everything if you factor in those calls which go to voicemail uh those calls which uh, uh maybe a bad number uh disconnect the number or something like that it's about 10 percent. and mark how many people make up a i would say reasonably reliable survey the the minimum uh, that you would want to do is about 335, uh, and it 
uh, that that's for the sort of statistical reliability, the minimum statistical reliability you want to get to. Uh, if you're doing something on a larger geographic uh, scale, it probably needs to be, you know, usually I try to shoot for a minimum for a statewide survey of at least 400 uh, and usually five to 600 is that. And are these uh, people who will be registered to vote likely voters, or just those who answer their phone, whether they're registered or not? If we're doing a if we're doing a political survey, it is uh, likely voters. Likely voters. All right, let's uh, discuss some of the races and start with the the big one in the state, which of course is the race for governor. What are your What does your polling suggest? Well. That one's been a tough one uh, because, you know, there are – actually, there are more than four people, but there are four pro main candidates, uh, and then there's, I think, two other uh, individuals who are running uh, that haven't, uh, you know, really – I say this respectfully, but their campaigns have not been as robust as the primary four candidates, what I would call the big four. So, look. Somebody is going to win that race with a plurality. Uh, it's not going to be a majority. It's going to be a plurality. That means that there's not one of the four candidates is going to get the 50% of the vote, uh, and that person will be the nominee. And as you said at the kickoff of the show, uh, you know, he who wins the Republican primary in West Virginia right now is the odds-on favorite to win the general election. Uh, and I think that right here at the end, uh, you've seen arguably a little bit of separation for, for, uh, with, with Patrick Morrissey, um, for a familiar face to the Eastern Panhandle, obviously. And I think that he has, uh, during his closing argument, uh, which is what I always call kind of the last week to 10 days of the election, during his closing argument to the electorate, um, he has really, uh, pushed uh, a message uh, that featured Donald Trump, featured Donald Trump Jr., uh, talked about Morrissey's experience uh, as a uh, attorney general uh, and some of the things he's done in this state. And I think that was a strong closing argument. Uh, my instinct is that it's going to push him a little bit over the top. But again, this is a really, really close election. You're looking at um, – you know, and I, I'm going to speak uh, aggregately here, I guess, macro. Uh, Morris, he's probably all, you know, he's around 30 to 32, 33 percent, something like that. Uh, and then more Capito has shown some growth in recent weeks. Um, you know, he is a lot of people would have said his campaign was stagnant uh, at the kind of the beginning of the primary season and towards the middle, but then he came in really strong. He came in strong with, uh, <clears throat> an excuse me, I'm sorry, an endorsement from Governor Justice, uh, and he really turned it on there at the end. Uh, so I think he's sort of right at uh, Patrick Morrissey's heels. Uh, and then Chris Miller and Mac Warner are both, you know, they're, look, guys, they're within striking. Um, this is not an election where, where somebody's going uh, to win by a significant amount uh, of votes. It's going to be really, really close, uh, and I think it's really, really interesting. And it's a hard thing. I think, you know, as a pollster, you hear and pay attention to polls uh, from campaign stuff that's been released in the media. And one week you'll hear, oh, more Capito is, is doing well and he's at 30 percent or uh, Chris Miller has, has made a move. And I think that's because voters were really paying a lot of attention to this race. There were 15 percent to 18 uh, percent were undecided really going into the last 10 days. And I think they were going back and forth between uh, those four candidates. That, um, that amount of undecided voters. Uh, so I think just in the last week, vo the voters of West Virginia, that 15 percent who were undecided in the go governor's race, started making up their minds about whom they would vote for. Uh, and so I think it's really kind of been decided here in the last, like I said, seven to ten days. 
Mark, can you predict or does your mechanism predict uh, between the turnout between the uh, the Republicans and the independents? <clears throat> well, we always uh, try to do a really good job at predicting based on, uh, you know, so that's what we would call our sampling frame, right? How many independents are going to make up the Republican primary uh, turnout? And we use historic data. What does it look like previously? What is the current? And then you match that with what the current registration looks like. Uh, and we've got about 15 to 18 percent of the Republican primary being um, independent or unaffiliated voters uh, participating in the GOP primary. So the overwhelming majority is still going to be registered Republican uh, and to the tune of, you know, call it somewhere between 80 and 85 percent. Are we seeing regional concentrations of votes where we see that Mac is really strong in this part of the state and Moore is really strong in that part of the state? You you really do. Um, and I think, you know, look, I think the candidate that figured that out the, and is strategic about that, that's a great question. I think that candidate will probably do the best. You know, it's no surprise that uh, Patrick Morrissey, I think, is going to do really, really well in the Eastern Panhandle. Um, I think more capita is going to do really, really well in, in Pinal and, and kind of Putnam County. Uh, and that really kind of turns your, your, you know, in, in national politics, you always hear, hear about battleground states. Well, in West Virginia, I think there's some battleground counties. And those could be the Raleigh and Mercer County areas of the state, which is Beckley Bluefield. Uh, you know, there's a large swath of Republican primary voters there. I think Wood County, uh, which is Parkersburg, that also holds uh, some fruitful ground uh, in terms of Republicans. Uh, and then look, Mon County, uh, I know people just because WVU's there uh, have a tendency to think that it's a solidly Democrat uh, county, but there, there's a lot of Republican votes there. Uh, and so I think kind of those three areas, Wood County, uh, the Montegalia, Harrison County region, and the Raleigh slash Mercer region. I think those are kind of the big three areas, uh, and I think you're seeing that if you look at the t television buys that have been put together by these candidates, where they're spending their time, uh, how they're spending their time, uh, indicates that that at least some of those campaigns know that those are those are battleground counties. Mark Blankenship is our guest here on the program on this election day, getting uh, some polling data from Mark. Uh, another high-profile race, of course, is Attorney General J.B. McCuskey, Mike Stewart, the prominent names there. Any data on that? Yeah, we, um, we've we seen um, J.B. McCuskey uh, kind of open it up here in the last few weeks. Um, you know, he's had the resources uh, to prosecute a, a, a more well-rounded campaign, right? Uh, and I know both those guys. I know Stuart fairly well, and I know uh, J.B. Fairly, fairly well. Uh, and J.B. has just been able to be up on television. He's been able to be on radio. He's been able to do some significant direct mail. Uh, you know, he also matches uh, in terms of you know, kind of the energy in the grassroots. He's always somewhere, and he's always talking to voters. Uh, and so, I, you know, my educated guess is that he will pull that off, uh, and it'll be uh, noticeable. And, and that's not to disparage Mr. Stewart. I think uh, Mr. Stewart's a, a good guy. He's a state senator. Uh, it's just that he had a more difficult time raising um you know, the resources necessary to purchase television ads, to pay for direct mail, to purchase the online digital ads and that sort of thing. So uh, he's been a little constrained in terms of uh, getting his message out. The U.S. Senate seat, Jim Justice Alex Mooney, uh, that uh, most people seem to think uh, that Governor Justice is comfortably ahead in that. Uh I think comfortably is an understatement, uh, and in full disclosure, I have worked uh, for Governor Justice in the past and on, on his political campaigns. I do not now, uh, but just so you and your viewers know, um, but we have done polling uh, for his campaigns previously. 
all that being said, I think he's probably, you know, my best guess is that he will get uh, something in the neighborhood of 65% of the vote uh, versus Mooney, who will get something in the neighborhood of uh, 35% of the vote. Wow. That, that is uh, dominant. Uh, in regards it, to – oh, go ahead, Mark. It really will be. Um, and, and, you know, um, Governor Justice has, has been dominant in – really each of these elections that he set in um you know his that's what i think is the interesting story there um you know he did have a primary challenge in 2020 and he won by you know 30 percent in the general election uh against salango he won by you know i think it was around 35 percent but it Mm -hmm. it was very significant uh and then even when he was a registered democrat and 2016 and ran in that primary and i think that was a three or four way race he won significantly then too so uh you know his his margins of victory have been impressive mark we're down to just a couple of minutes here so maybe some quick answers on these ones uh what do you have at secretary of state uh that's another tough one um i think that uh uh I think it's a tough question. I think that there's at the top, there's probably, again, I've seen in the last week, Doug Scaff and Henry kind of separate themselves. Uh, and, and I think that's going to be very competitive. It's going to be like the governor's race. You're going to see it decided by a, a handful of votes. It's, it's going to be really close. Auditor. Uh, auditor. I think that uh, it's going to be between householder and hunt. Uh, and I think uh, Hunt is making a real play for southern West Virginia for the, the Pinal County area, Charleston. Uh, and I think Householder is going to do really, really well in the eastern Panhandle and kind of the Wheeling and Morgan County area. So I think that that one could actually be decided by the composition of the turnout, which of those geographies has a better, you know, kind of more robust turnout. Uh, if Pinal County turns out pretty big, uh, that will favor Hunt. The Eastern Panhandle will obviously favor Householder. Um, and that, that's an interesting one to look at, guys, and I know I'm trying to be quick here, but Kanawha County makes up about 9 to 10% of Republican turnout, and that's about what those three Eastern Panhandle, Berkeley, Je- Eastern Panhandle counties in Berkeley, Jefferson, and Morgan, they usually make up about you know 10 to 11%. So if they bat even, if one of them wins big in the Eastern Panhandle, one of them wins big in Kanawha County, then you're going to have to look at those other uh, counties that I just mentioned uh, across the state and see who can do the best there. But that's a really, really close race. It should be really exciting to watch. uh, We have a couple of high-profile Senate races in the 15th and 16th here, and I know there's a caveat. You can't release information or generally don't unless the candidates have released it as well. Do you have anything on those races you can tell us in in regards to the 15th and 16th? I think the incumbents, I think you have, you know, the Senate president and and, uh, Lieutenant Governor Craig Blair. Uh, He's in a three-way race, uh, and I think that, you know, my sense is that, that he's running pretty strong there. Look, a lot of times in these down-ballot races, it's always important to understand, and as much as we talk about the governor's races and the Senate races, and there's 15% undecided in those down-ballot races, more local, smaller races, the number of undecided voters is really, really high going into the week before Election Day, right? So it could be anywhere from 40 to 45% are undecided, uh, and those voters are, you know, they're not unicorns out there they make their decisions just like everybody else does they base them on uh, how's the economy doing or how's job creation doing uh, and you know in this election i think part of it is about uh, donald trump uh, and then you have some of the more social issues uh, you know the pro-life issues and that sort of thing so what i always try to do is look and say who has check the box on all those issues and who has the resources to talk about them. So in the, in the instance of the, the, the incumbents there, uh, specifically Blair, you know, the economy's doing better uh, than it's done in, in quite some time in West Virginia. He gets some credit for that. Uh, tax cuts, uh, largest tax cuts 
in history, uh, he gets some credit for that, right? Uh, on the pro-life stuff, they passed some really strong pro-life uh, legislation. He gets credit for that. Uh, and when I say he gets credit for that, I mean that's the way the voters will, will size that up. Uh, so I think right here at the end, that 45% will have a tendency to uh, break his way. Uh, and I think he's probably in a pretty uh, strong position. Now, in the Rucker uh, householder race. Espinosa, um, Rucker. Rucker yeah, Espinosa. Sorry. Yeah, Espinosa. Um, in that race, uh, Espinosa has a little bit more of an argument because he is an incumbent member of the House of Delegates. Uh, but Senator Rucker, you know, she's known as a strong conservative, uh, and she, too, will be able to uh, make those arguments uh, that I just rattled off. Uh, that one will be a little bit closer, uh, you know, than what I anticipate the Blair one to be. Um, and I think uh, you guys probably have a good sense that, that, like I said earlier, who's made the closing argument the best? Uh, in that that Rucker Espinosa race, uh, and like I said, look at about the last ten days and see who has has really hammered those messages that are important to voters. Uh, because look, polling is you know there's an art to it too. There's a there's a uh, a logic that should be applied in the, the analysis of all of this, uh, and that's what I'm really talking about. Is who's made that closing argument. And who's hit the key points that Republican primary voters want uh, to hear about? And Mark, on on that note, we're over time, so I've got to say goodbye. I appreciate your time this morning very much. Thank you, guys. I appreciate you all. Have a great election day, sir. Thanks, Mark. You too. It's uh, 804. This is Talk Radio, WRI Martinsburg and TV 10. Candidate for Governor Chris Miller will join us next. <laughs>